Good morning. I'm all in. Are you all in? Good. Yes, I'm all in. That's the response. Good. You're getting there. You know, back at the uh, American Football Coaches Association banquet a few months ago, Nick Saban spoke about how he met his wife, Terry. He said that she was a city girl, cheerleader, majorette that was, you know, a little too good for him. He was a country bumpkin who, whose dad owned a gas station. And try as he may, he could not win her over. Starting in the seventh grade, he tried to gain her attention, to date her, but she had a boyfriend by the name of Mickey Shaver. He could never turn her head until one day his football team went over and played her school and apparently he had a great game and he turned her head. She noticed him at that point and so they started dating. Her relationship with Mickey Shaver ended. They started dating. They get married and then many years later he returns to his alma mater, his high school for Nick Saban Day. They roll out the red carpet. They are honoring Nick Saban and all his accomplishments, you know, hometown hero, and Mickey Schaefer is there. He now owns a gas station, and so Saban says, I'm going to take full advantage of this opportunity, and so he drives Terry, his wife, by the gas station that Mickey Schaefer owns, and he says, see, honey, if you'd stayed with him, this is what you'd be living in, and she goes, baloney, if I'd stayed with him, he'd be coach at Alabama right now. We're in a series entitled, What Would Jesus Undo? You've heard WWJD back in the 90s, those bracelets that people wore. It's a valid question. What would Jesus do? But we're asking another valid question throughout this series. What would Jesus undo? And this morning we're looking at pride. How many of you struggle with pride? Yeah, some of you are raising your hand. This, this sermon is for you this morning. However, This sermon is really for the people who didn't raise their hand. Pride is tricky because the people who need to hear a sermon on pride are typically the ones who tune it out. So I realize I had my work cut out for me this morning. But would you consider the possibility that you may be prideful? Would you at least consider that possibility this morning? Can I ask you to do that? Would you at least consider that pride might be a problem in your life? How about this? Would you at least consider that you may be the most prideful person in the auditorium this morning? I'm not saying you are, but would you at least consider it? And let me tell you something, if you're not willing to consider that, you're prideful. My guess is that most of you agree with the possibility that you could be prideful. My guess is, as we're going through this, you're saying, yeah, Chris, I I am prideful. I've got a problem with it, or at least I could have, so I I need to acknowledge that. What if I told you that I had a problem with pride? You would probably respond with, yes, I get it. I do too. I understand, Chris. What if I told you that I have a problem with lust or pornography? I don't, but what if I told you that? You would look at that differently. You would look at me differently, right? Because we see those as more egregious sins than pride. Pride is like a class C misdemeanor, whereas the felonies are like lust and, and idolatry and, and, and things of that nature. We all struggle with pride to a certain degree. When we look at the things that God hates, we see these words. Proverbs chapter 6, beginning in verse 16. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven things that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who declares lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. What's the one sin that drives you crazy? What's the one sin that makes your blood boil? The one sin that when you see it on TV, you want to punch the television? Is it abortion? Sex trafficking? Homosexuality? What's that one sin that drives you nuts? Think about this. What do you think is the one sin that drives God crazy? What's the one sin that makes his blood boil? Do you think it's maybe something like idolatry? Maybe it's racial injustice? What is number one on God's hate parade? Well, we don't have to guess. It tells us right here in Proverbs chapter 6. Haughty eyes, arrogant condescending, looking down on someone, being the center of your own world. Here's what pride is. That's pride. 
here's what we should be doing as Christians is shining the spotlight on everybody else and shining the spotlight on God. But all too often it gets turned on us. We want the light shining on us. We want to bask in its glow. We want to be the center of attention, right? Why did Eve ultimately give in to temptation and eat from the wrong menu? Because of pride, right? So you're telling me that God sees haughty eyes or pride as one of the things that he despises most? I mean, it seems rather benign, doesn't it? Is pride really that serious? And the answer is yes. And do you know why? Because pride is behind every sin. Every sin. Pride is behind every sin. It started in the garden. Why did Eve eat from the wrong menu? Because she was so famished and so hungry that she had to have something? No, there's plenty of fruit in the garden. Plenty of fruit that she could have eaten. Satan came in and tempted her, enticed her, by saying that God is jealous. God doesn't want you to be like him. God doesn't want to share the spotlight with you. Which is ridiculous because we know from the very beginning God created Eve and Adam to be like him. He most definitely wanted them to be like him. That's why he created them to be image bearers in the world. But he says to her, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan enticed her and the rest is history. Pride infiltrated her heart, and pride has been behind every sin ever since. Cain murdering his brother Abel, David committing adultery with Bathsheba, David staging the murder of Bathsheba's husband, King Nebuchadnezzar losing his kingdom, Jonah running from God, Samson growing arrogant and getting uh, too big for his britches. We see it with Ananias and Sapphira. We see it with Saul persecuting Christians, Peter denying Jesus, King Solomon, King Saul, Diotrephes. We could go on, but you get the idea. And then notice Galatians 5, 19 through 21. It says, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Is pride not behind every one of these? In fact, we could say that every one of these are just a byproduct of pride. They're just a manifestation of pride. They all stem from pride. Pride is the number one thing that keeps people out of heaven. Look with me at Luke chapter 18. Verse 9 and following, it says, Now he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector, The Pharisee stood and began praying this in regard to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, crooked, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to raise his eyes towards heaven, but was beating his chest saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went away to his house justified rather than the other one. For everyone who humbles himself... Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus says two men went to church. One went home dignified, the other went home justified. And it reminds me of the, uh, of the lady that was teaching five-year-olds in the Sunday school class. She used this, this illustration, this parable, as an example of, of pride and how to avoid pride. And she talked about how the publican was the one who really was the one justified because he came to God in the right manner, where the Pharisee just kind of bragged. And then she closed her class by saying, okay, folks, let's all bow our heads and pray that we're not like the Pharisee. Obviously, she missed the point, right? Pride is sly. It creeps in. It infiltrates and it diminishes everything else that we're striving to do as a Christian. And our efforts to justify it don't do it justice either. You know, we talk about swagger or assertiveness. We, you know, we talk about being confident. It masquerades as strength. It disguises itself as independence. And it uses intellect as camouflage, bravery as camouflage. It even boasts in its humility. Like the lady who came up to the preacher after church and said, I just feel like I'm the prettiest person woman in this church I know I shouldn't think that way I just feel like I'm the prettiest woman in church can you help me with this and the preacher said 
Well, ma'am, in your case, it's not a sin. It's just a horrible mistake. <laughs> when, I was putting, when I was putting the finishing touches on this sermon, I thought to myself, this may be the best sermon on pride ever given. <laughs> we do a good job at work, and we get a raise and a promotion. But we forget who gave us the ability to work, who gave us those talents, who gave us the opportunity to have a job. We do a good deed and then post it on Facebook for everyone to see so that they will like it and comment on how great a person we are. We make excuses and alibis instead of accepting when we're wrong and admitting when we're wrong and and taking constructive criticism. Pride is the bee that drowns in its own honey. But here's the deal. Pride is an equal opportunity destroyer. It's not just the haughty or the arrogant, as we think of haughty and arrogant. It's even the person who doesn't have much, the poor person who says, poor pitiful me, look at me, help me. I'm the center of attention because I'm so lowly and self-deprecating and self-loathing. Pride is an equal opportunity destroyer. And pride is really interesting, isn't it? Because it's, it's flavorless, it's odorless, it's sizeless, it's tasteless, and yet it's the hardest thing to swallow. But that's the goal, right? To swallow your pride. And not only swallow it, swallow it, but keep it down. Because there are some people who can swallow their pride for the moment, but they quickly regurgitate it back up. The key is to keep it down. If I'm doing something that upsets God's stomach, I want to do everything possible to not make him sick. I don't know if it's true, but there's this story about Muhammad Ali traveling on an airplane. And as the airplane is taxiing, He has not fastened his safety belt. And the flight attendant comes by and says, Sir, I need you to fasten your seatbelt. And he responds, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And the flight attendant responds, Superman don't need no airplane either. Please fasten your (laughs) seatbelt. Pride is more than just smack talk, okay? There's way more to it, and it goes much deeper than that. First of all, pride defies. Pride is a fist in the face of God. Pride created the devil. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they did not prevail. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So apparently, there was this rebellion in heaven at some point. Satan was not happy, and the other angels were not happy with their rank or their level. You know, you had archangels, you had cherubim, you had seraphim, so you had these different rankings of angels, and apparently some didn't like their order, they didn't like where they were ranked, and so they rebelled, all because of pride. And because of pride, they were cast down out of heaven onto the earth. Pride was behind this. Satan acted out because of pride, selfish ambition. He rebelled against God. Pride ruined paradise, pride wrecked the world, all war, all strife, all pain, all hurt, all discord, all disharmony, all disarray is the result of pride. Pride defies God and his perfect order of things. Not only that though, pride defiles as well. Proverbs 16.5 reads, everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. Well, that's pretty direct, isn't it? But pride assumes independence from God. Pride assumes this personal autonomy, and it all begins in the heart. Pride is an inside job, and it manifests itself in the way that we carry ourselves, our attitude, our speech, our actions. But its genesis is the heart. As a result, instead of God regulating and controlling our heartbeat, our heart eventually beats out of rhythm. We go into spiritual AFib. And you can't live with a spiritual arrhythmia too long before it affects your spiritual health. So pride defies, it defiles, it also divides. Proverbs 13, 10, through overconfidence comes nothing but strife, but wisdom is with those who receive counsel. Proverbs 28 and 25 says, an arrogant person stirs up strife, but one trusts in the Lord, one who trusts in the Lord will prosper. Pride creates division. There's never been an argument, there's never been a war, there's never been a divorce, there's never been a church split where pride wasn't involved. Never. 
You think about the division in our society, whether it be race or politics or religion, all of it is the result of pride. Pride breeds divisiveness. You ever had a, an argument with your spouse, the kind that the neighbors can hear? It's ego versus ego, isn't it? It's about, can I win here? What button can I push to get the last word and to thus win? But you know, you may win, but you're always losing. And you may win and still be the problem. You can be right and still be wrong, right? It's ego versus ego. When pride reigns in our heart, it comes out when we have these kind of arguments. But when Jesus reigns in your heart, something else takes place something else takes over he takes over and you produce peace because Jesus was peaceable right and so being a peacemaker he bridges the gap therefore when Jesus is alive in you pride is dead in you and peace not contention is the result but here's something else that pride does pride dishonors pride wants honor that's the goal of pride the interesting thing about pride though is the more relentlessly it pursues honor the more it incurs shame it goes after honor, but all it gets is shame in the end. Proverbs eleven two reads, when pride comes, then comes dishonor, but with the humble there is wisdom. Pride wants to be petted, but pride cannot be petted enough. You can't pet pride enough. Proverbs 29, 23 states, a person's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. You know, it's very fitting that the middle letter in pride is I, because I is at the middle of pride. Pride is an I problem. It's an eye problem that has to be dealt with, and it's an eye problem that always ends in shame if something isn't done about it. It's like the story of the turtle that wanted to go to Florida, but he knew he could never make it in his lifetime. It was too far away. He saw some geese flying south for the winter, and so he called them down, and he came up with a plan. It was an ingenious plan. He got two geese and a rope, and he told them to each hold an end of the rope in their beak, and then he clamped onto the middle of the rope. So he's flying down to Florida, and there's a farmer on the ground that notices this and is completely amazed and, so, and totally impressed. And he asks, well, that's great. Who thought of that idea? And the turtle couldn't resist. He said, I did. <laughs> Pride cannot resist. It has to be petted. It needs attention. Pride also destroys. Proverbs 15, 25, the Lord will tear down the house of the proud, but he will set the boundary of the widow. You know, there are some Christians that are too big for God to use. They feel as though that God should be honored by their presence and their prowess. And it's not just spiritual ruin that they incur. Some of you are suffering ruin in other areas of your life. Some of you are suffering from financial ruin because your neighbors keep buying things that you can't afford. You're trying to keep up with the Joneses. And you realize that there's not enough month at the end of your money. Whether it's financial ruin or spiritual ruin, pride always promises more than it can deliver. It always takes you further than you want to go. And it always costs you more than you want to pay. Pride is toxic. It's poison. And you know what the antidote is? Humility. And you're saying, well, Chris, it's almost 1120 and you're going to launch into humility now. No, I'm, I'm not going to go too deep into humility. That is the antidote. We can talk about that at another time. But I do want you, as we close, to consider a few questions. They may sound silly on the surface, but consider and contemplate this week these questions. This may be more for our young people, this first question. When you're running to the car, do you yell, shotgun? Or do you say, back seat, middle, feet on the hump? <laughs> Every Thursday, the staff goes and eats together, and we take the church van, and Blake sits in the very back of the van. There's only six of us. He sits in the very back because he says, I'm more humble than all of y'all. <laughs> Think about where you sit. At a dinner banquet, a fundraiser, something like that, do you sit at the table closest to the food? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? You bow your head during the prayer and you kind of do this, inch over towards the food. So when the prayer is over, you're like, oh, I'm already here. I might as well get in line. At church or somewhere else, where do you park? Do you park at the very front or do you leave those front spaces open because 
you're able to walk and somebody else may not be able to. Silly questions, perhaps, but you got to start somewhere. You got to crawl before you can walk. Start somewhere, start simple. Think about the little things in your life that may lend itself to pride. Start with an attitude, a mentality, an outlook that shines the spotlight there and there instead of here all the time, right? Quit basking in the spotlight and think of ways that you can take the spotlight off yourself and shine it towards someone else. Ronald Reagan one time was giving a a speech in Mexico City to a very large audience. And it was meant to be an emotional, inspirational speech, but he was disappointed at the lack of reaction. So he sits down to very little applause, and the next man that gets up is uh, of Mexican descent, and he begins speaking, and, and Ronald Reagan's taken even more aback by the reaction this guy's getting. Like they're applauding even at times, standing and cheering, and, and now Reagan feels really low. So he decides he's going to clap longer and and harder than anybody when the ambassador leans over to him and says, I wouldn't do that if he were you. He said, why? And he goes, because he's interpreting your speech. It may sound silly to, to clap at your own speech, but that was an honest mistake by Ronald Reagan. Sometimes our mistakes are not so honest. In fact, sometimes they're intentional when it comes to pride. Let's work this week to take the spotlight off ourselves and place it on others. Jesus did that. You know how he did it? By washing feet. By taking up a towel. It's hard to be prideful when you're washing someone's feet. Let's look for ways to serve others this week. Kevin's going to lead us in a song if we can help you. This Kevin right here. That Kevin. He's going to lead us in a song if we can help you in some way. If you'd like to study the Bible with someone. There is water in the baptistry now, and from what I understand, it's warm. So if we can do that this morning, whatever your need is, why don't you come as we stand and as we sing.